Welcome to the July edition of Directions, AT&T's all-employee video magazine. Coming up, we'll see how the new union contracts address family issues. We'll find out why the Federal Systems Division put strategic business units to work. We'll get an update on how redeployment is paying off for the company. And we'll celebrate the centennial of the payphone. This is Directions, AT&T's video magazine. April 5th. AT&T officers and union officials gather in Washington, D.C. to begin talks on new contracts affecting 160,000 employees. It's the first time in AT&T's history that the chairman has participated in the opening of negotiations. And uh, from what I've seen, I think uh, the relationships are very positive, they're very strong. We've worked hard at that, and we have a mutual resolve to have a successful uh, negotiation in 1989. We simply seek a contract that brings us jobs with justice. Our union representatives are experienced negotiators and well prepared for the operation ahead. They come to the bargaining table with an open mind, a sincere wish to negotiate fairly, and a strong determination to reach a fair and just contract with job security for our members. Negotiations resulted in contracts that are being recognized for their groundbreaking features on family issues. Both sides recognize that changes in the American family are reshaping our workforce. We talked to employees in Kansas City about the kinds of problems that the new contracts, if ratified, will address. Kansas City is probably, you know, the same as other parts of the country. There are big gaps in infant care, in after-school care for older children, in care for sick children. To increase the supply of child and elder care in communities where more services are needed, a family care development fund of $5 million will be established. Jointly administered by the company and the unions, the fund will give financial support to new programs serving our union-represented employees. Well, it's one of the major expenses of our family is child care. Every week, we pay almost $100 for child care. The new contracts will allow employees relief from some of their financial burden. Dependent care reimbursement accounts will allow employees to obtain tax savings on money set aside for qualified child care or elder care expenses. Up to $5,000 a year can be placed into the account. Oftentimes when you look through the paper for pertinent care, for elderly people, it's, it's tough to just take a look at a place and know that uh, some place that has care is going to be useful for you. To assist employees, the company will make child care and elder care resources and referral services available. These professional services will help employees locate, evaluate, and plan their dependent care. Last March of 88, my mother, which is a diabetic, went into a diabetic coma unexpectedly, and I had to leave work. And I am the second of four children, and I'm the only one still living in the city. So therefore, it was up to me to go to the hospital. And if I'd had a, been able to take a leave to do this without worrying about it, uh, it would have been less stress on me. Family Care Leave will allow employees leave to take care of a seriously ill family member for up to 12 months. Some benefits apply. I wished I could have had more time with my baby. One of the biggest drawbacks was not having my benefits, being cut down to one income, and then having to pay for my insurance if I wanted to keep it up. So really, it, you know, financial situation forced me to come back to work sooner than I would have liked to. AT&T's care for newborn child leave will be enhanced with benefits extended to the first six months. Leave is extended for up to 12 months with guaranteed reinstatement of employment. Another issue for many families is adoption costs. They told us two and a half to three years and here we have him nine months later and uh, that burden of 
the money, you know, we thought we had enough time to maybe save a little here and there, and and uh, boom, we had a we had a baby before we knew it. With adoption assistance, employees will be reimbursed up to $2,000 for expenses associated with the legal adoption of a minor child. The family care features of the new contracts will help employees deal with these issues. We're not solving the problem, but we're trying to help them solve the problem for themselves. And we think that's very, very important so that they can concentrate fully on working with our customers. In the world of defense, new levels of technology are prompted not only by our own innovations, but also by the innovations of our potential enemies. If you were swimming off the coast of the Atlantic and a modern Soviet submarine, its most recent type, came by you doing five knots, just barely submerged, and was less than 200 yards away from you, and we're talking now about a boat 400 feet long that displaces 9,000 tons, you wouldn't hear it go by. The problem of locating and tracking ultra-quiet submarines prompted the development of a new signal processor called EMSP. A signal processor is a high-speed computer that analyzes information from radar, sonar, and other electronic sensors. EMSP, developed at AT&T Bell Labs, can perform over a billion mathematical calculations per second. This kind of computing power puts it in the same league as a Cray supercomputer. Kurt Weaver heads the marketing effort. The computer that we're talking about primarily here today, the EMSP, is the first data flow computer that the military has ever had. It's the only one of its kind right now in the world. It's very unique. Uh, any computer you've ever dealt with, even a PC on your desk, has either what's called a master program clock or a master program counter or both and they control the operation of the computer. We don't have either. We have an entirely data-driven machine, and it's a fascinating advance in computer technology. EMSP is also the only signal processor on the market that can be programmed with user-friendly graph notation, which is then automatically translated into code. But selling a product as advanced as EMSP can present special marketing problems when your customers plan in 20-year cycles. Everyone assumes that since so much research and development effort does go into military products, that they always have leading edge. But the very nature of the procurement cycle in the military is such that by the time they actually get products to the fleet, it isn't state-of-the-art anymore. So the customer has to have confidence that what we're building will not only work, but will be able to be improved and maintained at a near state-of-the-art level through the life of the weapon system, which may be 10 to 20 years. An evolving product with this kind of lifespan needed a smart business strategy, and so the Federal Systems Division created a special team dedicated to EMSP, a team called a Strategic Business Unit, or SBU. The SBU is a company within a company. We have total responsibility for all aspects of running and executing this business. We have the project management people here in North Carolina. Uh, we have Bell Laboratories supporting us out of New Jersey in the R&D functions. We have manufacturing people matrixed into us, putting together a company within a company. Uh, that is responsible for executing jobs for our customers and making that portion of the business profitable. The exact same group of people have taken EMSP from the day it was proposed to the Navy in response to a government request for proposal back in 82. They have designed it, they've prototyped it, they've programmed it, they've built it. It's the same group of people. When I get information from a customer that they need something in particular, whether it's a change to our product or information about our product, I can go to exactly the right people and get that information or get that change made. And the organizations have been very stable, so we can execute changes rapidly. We can support the customer on a very timely basis. Close communication between members of the SBU team keeps everyone conscious of the business needs. Those people uh, keep 
our attention focused on the market. They keep our attention focused on the customer. They make us aware of, of uh, profit and loss uh, and what our role is in the uh, profitability of the business is. This approach encourages product development driven by customer need. For example, one Navy customer's request led to the development of a new version of EMSP. The current EMSP is simply too large to fit on, an, on a lot of airplanes. So we needed a smaller version of it to, to capture uh, additional market. To begin with, it's about 40% uh, more powerful, uh, and it's uh, considerably smaller. It occupies a few cubic feet, whereas the current version is up in the neighborhood of 20 cubic feet. We could realistically do from two to three billion dollars worth of sales off of this product. The successful pursuit of this market depends on closely coordinated teamwork. And in a strategic business unit, teamwork is spelled SBU. Last year, AT&T faced a shrinking market share and launched a redeployment program to beef up its sales force. Staff employees volunteered to be reassigned to new positions in the field sales offices, resulting in a 50% growth in the sales force. The big question is, has it helped? Well, one measure of success is customer satisfaction. We talked to three customers in Manhattan and asked them whether they've seen a change in AT&T. We begin with Bear Stearns, a leading investment banking and brokerage firm. In 1988, this customer, potentially a $60 million client, was suddenly awarding business to MCI. I should never have to educate a vendor like AT&T on how things work. The other vendors that had opportunities, uh, which uh, ended up getting the business, um, really didn't need that. Uh, they didn't need an education in our business. They had a clear understanding of what we needed, uh, and they came back with a very suitable price and a very fair price. Things began to change positively for Bear Stearns uh, at the end of 1988. At that time, redeployed people began to enter the branch. What redeployment has meant is that a branch manager can take accounts, give them to someone to market and to service, and allow me and the people that I work with to be free to work solely on one account, which is Bear Stearns. They were supporting me through my management problems. And I think that's one of the biggest benefits out of an appropriate account management team, is that it's really a partnership and it's not uh, a sales relationship only. A very different customer is Fordham University, New York's third largest university. We're just so disoriented in terms of communicating even within our, our own walls. And it's just surprising, to, very surprising to me that AT&T wasn't around until I called. With the redeployment, what happened was a lot of people were brought in the branch and I was assigned a permanent systems consultant. Uh, which was, which was a great thing for me because, again, I would go to one person for whatever I needed at that point. While Vic Tawar, who is the account executive on Fordham University, was also responsible for um, several other accounts that I picked up out of his module, he was off talking to Fordham about a very large tele telecommunications solution for them involving both equipment and network. What we recommended at that point was System 85, just a simple, basic System 85. Uh, with some analog, digital, and hybrid phones, and expand it as as the university grew, they could expand it. They can they can they can build their communication future on that system. This is the point I've learned from AT and T. It's not just that you want to sell a product; you're convinced that the welfare of this place would be greatly enhanced by using this product. And and I think AT and T has to recognize that it's got the product. A third customer is Oppenheimer & Company, another brokerage firm whose business lifeline is the telephone. In 1986, we moved into our world headquarters. Uh, at that point in time, we installed an AT&T System 85. It was a five-module system. After the move-in, uh, we were not visited by the AT&T salesperson. We didn't have a relationship. AT&T lost a lot of business uh, during that time. It was a period of time when uh, we had reorganized and we were trying to 
focus on too many things at once, and uh, as a result, some pieces got neglected. My being in the branch and supporting Siobhan enabled her to spend more time and to focus her efforts on Oppenheimer, hence the win back in excess of $1 million with Oppenheimer. We won back from MCI at six locations, and uh, that's going to be almost $2 million in revenue annualized to AT&T. So it certainly pays off when you pay attention to, to the clients that are buying. We look at AT&T at this point in time as an extension of our department. These stories of renewed partnerships with AT&T's customers are not unique. Our customer satisfaction surveys show major improvement across the country. Overall customer satisfaction up 9%. Service knowledge up 4%. Responsiveness up 9%. Keeping customers informed up 17%. Is redeployment paying off? The answer is yes. For 100 years now, we've been pumping our coins into pay telephones. CNN's G.D. Mose takes a look back at unique bits of Americana, the payphone and its booth. It was a century ago that an inventor named William Gray hit pay dirt with this pay phone. His wife was very ill one night, and he tried to get a phone to call a doctor. Gray had to beg to use the phone at a nearby factory. Eventually, that, he ended up patenting this payphone currently on loan from the Smithsonian for the AT&T Centennial Exhibit. This display of payphone history is now touring the country in a special exhibit created by AT&T. It was the invention of the payphone, after all, that first made telephone calling available to the general public. Back in 1889, an operator listened for the sound of your nickel or dime dropping and then put your call through. We are bringing this exhibit around the country to make people aware of uh, the heritage of the public phone and AT&T's connection with that heritage. Hollywood is well acquainted with that heritage. Oh, Mary. Hello, Sue. Hello, Paul. Hello, hello. Hey, Duffy. Deposit 10 cents for five minutes, please. Hey. Oh. This is Senora Forbes. This is Al. This is Aunt Mary. Mary, yeah, this is Charles. This is Jack. I got this. I got this. I got this. In today's world, we're fighting to keep pay phones part of AT&T's heritage and protect $2 billion in long-distance revenue. Under an equal access ruling, premise owners of Bell Operating Company payphones were given a choice of long-distance carriers. But an all-out sales effort by AT&T this winter and spring is now paying off for the company. So far, about two-thirds of the customers have picked. So it's early. But we're very pleased with our early results in finding that approximately three out of four of the customers have picked AT&T. The cutovers to the various long distance companies that have been picked for the public phones started in April and will be continuing through the fourth quarter of this year. But most of the phones will be cut over by June or July of this year. So employees should be very careful when they make a call from a public telephone that they access AT&T. Success on the equal access issue is one more reason for celebrating AT&T's payphone heritage. That does it. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye, darling. -bye, Good luck. This has been the July edition of Directions, an ongoing portrait of who we are today and where we're going next.